Thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about the work I have done recently together with Christian Schaffner at the University of Amsterdam and Stephanie Weiner from the Technical University of Delft. They're also both here at the conference, so ask also them if you have further questions. Moreover, I'm happy to finally announce that it's appeared on the archive. It just appeared today. So if you're interested in, check archive today and you find the details. So what I'm going to talk about is two-party cryptographic protocols. Examples are oblivious transfer, bit commitment, or secure identification. In the following, I'm mostly just concerned with oblivious transfer, in which Alice wants to send to Bob exclusively one of two messages, and Bob can secretly choose which one he wants to learn. But however, these parties don't trust each other. This means for oblivious transfer, I just explained that Alice doesn't want Bob to actually learn both of the messages, and Alice doesn't, uh, Bob doesn't want Alice to know which message he learned. But however, there are no-go theorems. So it's long known that this is not possible, even though Alice and Bob share a quantum, com or share, can do some quantum communication. So then there are ways around it. One have, can have computational assumptions, but however, we talked about, I mean, it's mentioned a lot in this conference, so it's like this, this everlasting security problem. Then there are other like, kind of ways to go around, which are like on using relativistic constraints. I don't want to go much in detail here. This can be used for bit commitment, for instance. But what I want to talk is about some constraints on the physical devices of an adversary. So a malicious party has only bounded and noisy storage. So, of course, in the classical case, this wouldn't be very interesting, but in a quantum case, it's, it's maybe interesting for a certain time period, because at the moment we know it's very hard and challenging to have good quantum memories. And especially, it's hard to have a lot of quantum memories. So there has been a lot of work, actually, in this field. It started with classical. Then one has analyzed the, the situation if one has a limited number of but perfect quantum memories. Then one has analyzed it for like a noisy quantum memory, noisy and bounded quantum memory. Then first on the individual storage attack, then general storage attack by relating it first to classical capacity of the, of the malicious parties memory channel, and then finally also to the quantum capacity. So, and what I'm going to talk about today is as a first kind of continuous variable implementation of such two-party protocols that provide security in the noisy storage model. So especially, we have like uh, protocols and security rules for oblivious transfer and bit commitment. There, I have to say, I mean, they're experimentally feasible, while attacking them needs some quantum memory. Actually, executing the protocol doesn't need any quantum memory. So in our work, we, rela it's, it, we relate the security to the classical capacity of this memory channel. And new tools we, we develop here are uncertainty relations for entropies. So maybe quickly on, because we didn't have so many continuous variable talks, why we interested in actually implement these protocols with continuous variables. So this is because it's very e it allows a very easy integration in standard telecommunication systems. One can do very efficient and, uh, and measurements on very high frequency. We had this nice poster here at, uh, at, uh, on, on Tuesday where they showed they can do this in gigahertz, like this continuous variable QKD. So you can run this protocol on very high clock hertz. So, Maybe it's a quick outlook what I'm going to now tell you about our work. So first, I will show you the protocol, then discuss correctness, how it's related to uncertainty relation, and then finally I will show you how it actually relates if we model a practical memory of, of such a malicious party. Okay, as I said, we are concentrating on oblivious transfer. And we look at the randomized version where Alice here outputs two bit strings, L bit strings, and Bob has a choice, like a bit, an input bit T, and an output 
which is also an L-bit string. And correctness that means that, first of all, that the output of L is a random, so Bob cannot guess them, and that uh, the choice of, of the input of Bob is actually re reflecting the choice, so this output of Bob is actually this S of T, so the message he wants to learn. Security for L Alice then means if Alice follows honestly the protocol, that Bob can only learn one of these strings here. On the other side, security for Bob means that Alice doesn't, does not learn which message he learned. And we do this in a composable fashion. I don't want to go into detail here because these are very tricky, especially for two-party protocols where actually the, the, the interacting parties can be malicious. Okay, so now about, about the protocol. So we look at now at the entanglement-based version. You can also do this in a prepare and measure uh, protocol. So it's exactly similar. And the tools you need is like continuous variable entangled states. I, from now on, call them just uh, EPR states, einstein podolsky rosen states. And they are just the, the, the continuous variable uh, analogon of the discrete, a uh, maximally entangled state in discrete variable world. So this means we have the quadrature, and the quadrature are, are so the quadr quadrature are, are strongly color correlated. The x and t both are strongly correlated, but if you measure one, one mode in x and the other mode in p, then they're completely uncorrelated. So the measurement we're using are normal homodyne detection, so quadrature of uh, measurements of x and p of these phase variables. So, and we assume that we have a discretized outcome. And the discretization here is now just uh, the size of the, the spinning here is uh, denoted by delta in the following. Good. So the quantum protocol is then very easy. It's like QKD. It's, uh, it's basically exactly the same. So Alice distributes this continuous variable EPR pairs. Then both measure randomly either in the X, the X or the P quadrature, and then generate the data. So after they executed the protocol, they're waiting at time delta t. This is basically the time uh, a malicious party has to store the signals if he wants to attack this protocol. Important property are just follow directly from the properties of the state of this EPR state. And these are that if both measure in the same basis here, then the outcome are perfectly or strongly correlated. In the, in the other case, they're not correlated. And moreover, what's important, they don't know in which rounds they have, cho or they have the same uh, basis choice. So now we can use that to generate oblivious transfer by only doing classical post-processing. And this is here, this is the protocol here. So in the protocol, first Alice sends the basis choice to Bob. Bob then checks in which rounds they have chosen the, the same basis, puts it in this, 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 this index set here, I of t, and t being the choice bit. That's important. And then he's also forming the index set of the, one, of the, base, of the signals in which they have chosen different bases. Then he sends both to Alice. Alice forms the corresponding substrings. For each substring, she's choosing a two universal hash function and just hashes the string, uh, the strings here to L bit strings. So then, Alice is computing error correction. This is very important for continuous variable. We have strongly correlated data, but they're not perfectly correlated, so we have to send some error correction. So she's just sending error correction for both substrings to Bob. Bob now knows that C of T, so the error correction to uh, V of T here, corresponds actually to the, to the strings that are correlated. He can use it, correct his outcomes, and then also apply the hash function. Alice also sends the hash function, and then gets the string out. So this is the protocol. So, and correctness just follows because Alice can actually, I mean, given this error correction works, then these two strings, C of T and C tilde of T, are exact, are basically in high probability the same, and then the outcomes will be the same. Security for Bob is also very easy because he only sends these two index sets and they're completely uncorrelated to his choice bit. So this is also simple. But different is the security for Alice. 
Because, of course, if, if Bob has a, a perfect quantum memory, he can just store all the signals until he receives the basis choice from Alice and then measure according to, the, to, the, to this basis choice and then get both of the strings. So this doesn't work if Bob has a perfect quantum memory. But now, what happens if the quantum memory is not perfect? And we're going to model the quantum memory as follows. So Bob has actually here an encoding operation where he encodes all the information or all the signals into a quantum memory here de denoted by f. And we assume that the fraction of quantum memories, n is the number of signal cells by Alice, is this new here. So he just encodes it into the quantum memory, has to wait for this time delta t until he gets the measurement choice from Alice. So in the following, we make a distinction about the power of the, uh, this malicious party by looking once at, at encoding strategies that are not restricted, so th there we don't have further assumptions. In the second part, we, we, we look at if this encoding is a, is a mixture of Gaussian channels. And another restriction, we look at if, if this encoding is only like independent and identical on each signal, or at least very, very small numbers of signals. So this is, the, this is basically the memory attack Bob can do. And because I'm, I, I don't have so much time, I just rushed through the, to the result here. And for the result, in order to understand them, I have to introduce two things. Of course, the, the power or, or how much, I mean, the security of this protocol has to depend on certain things of the malicious uh, party's quantum memory. And here, the, the, the crucial quantity is this classical strong converse capacity. So what, is, what, this, what this capacity is, is the, it's a capacity, is a rate above which if you want to send classical information through this channel, your success probability to do this I mean, reliably will decay exponentially. So we need this exponential decay that you actually can encode information classically. So this is this classical strong converse capacity. So and then we need another thing which I call the uncertainty rate. And the uncertainty rate basically tells me how much uncertainty uh, Alice can create by doing her measurement. So this is the picture. So we assume basically that, that Bob can send Alice an arbitrary state, and Alice is just doing the measurement either in X and P, and gets the outcomes. And we're asking here, the measure, the important measurement is the smooth mean entropy, and we ask on how, how much entropy we can generate by this, by this kind of, like in this situation. So these are the two quantities that are going to be important. And then what we show is that security can be achieved if the following holds. So we have here the, this uncertainty rate I just explained before. And then the, uh, this uncertainty rate minus the error correction rate. So the error correction information Alice has to send to Bob during the classical post-processing. So one half of this kind of difference here has to be bigger than, I would call this like the effective classical strong converse ca capacities. I just multiply with kind of the number or the fraction of, of quantum channels a malicious party has times this classical strong converse capacity. So if this is satisfied, then we get security. And the length of the bit string in this oblivious transfer is given by this formula here. OK. But now we, of course, want to, we have to quantify this, this uncertainty rate in order to say something for which kind of memory and in um, mean, which memory bounds we can actually get security. And for that, we, we derive three uncertainty relations. So relations of this form here, so we're interested in this quantity lambda. And the first one is no assumption. So this, is, this, this plot is like shown depending on, on the discretization of my homodyne detector. So this is the red line here. So this one is with, n with no assumption. So then we show a bound for on the Gaussian assumptions. These are Gaussian, in this memory attack model, these are Gaussian encodings. This is this blue line here. And then we show a bound for, for, for these like individual and independent encodings. This is translated in this picture, these are product states. And this is this green line, which 
Unfortunately, just the overlaps with the blue line. So, but what we, what, we, what we saw in the previous slide is that the error correction rate has, or, or like this uncertainty rate minus the error correction rate has to be at least larger than zero, meaning that, that these this, this bounds here have to be above this, this yellow line. So this is the error correction rate I plotted here for this parameter here, this, uh, for, for highly squeezed state here. But, so we see that, for instance, if we don't have any further assumption, we, we only have a small region of discretization in this discretization parameter where we are above this error correction rate. So we can get security without kind of assumption at the moment, but we have to assume very bad memories. Okay. So let me come to my last part and look at a certain model for, for this memory, for a malicious party's memory. And we look just at the at the loss channel with transmissivity tau and some noise, some additive Gaussian noise with a variance. So for, the, for this channel, we know this, strong, uh, this classical strong converse capacity, so we can actually analyze this security. So, and this is what we find. So here we plot, here is the, is the, the, the noise variance. This, so this all plots in h bar equal to two. So, and this is the transmissivity. So, and this is the fraction of, of, of quantum channel uh, a malicious party has. So, if we know that the fraction is, it's around like one tenth of the signals used of the, of the honest parties, then we, we see that we actually go very fast to like, like transmissivity that are very high. So, we have to have a, or the malicious party has to have a very, very good memory. So this is plotted for this kind of like uh, parameters here. Good, let me quickly summary the results. So I showed you a protocol for uh, optical continuous variable implementation for oblivious transfer. We also have a protocol and an ana a security analysis for bit commitment that's actually even simpler because it doesn't use error correction. So we showed security and Basically, the take home message is that we have to have a high uncertainty rate, a low error correction rate, and this has then to be bigger than this effective classical capacity. So we also showed some new uncertainty relations. We actually learned that they are, are very difficult, the one we, we were looking at, and there's still some open questions. So we saw that we don't have a good uncertainty relation due to, I believe, only technical region, uh, reasons that we cannot better get better security without further assumptions. Okay, and another open problem actually, I mean at the moment we reduce it to the classical capacity, but of course it's kind of away from the actual problem, so we want to actually relate this to the quantum capacity of the channel. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, so we have time for one quick question, maybe. You said that you have composable security. Which flavor do you mean? Like uh, sequential, concurrent, parallel, universal? Oh, that is actually universal. We can, you can concatenate this in an arbitrary fashion. And how do you get around the problem that then the simulator's uh, quantum memory can be used to break the other instances? Uh. Maybe we can ask Stephanie there. <laughs> she's she's a secu uh, composer of security. Sequential. Sequential. Ah, sequential. Ah, sequential. Okay. Sorry. Okay, then, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One more question? Yeah. Do you have any plans for implementation? Uh, if 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 somebody is interested in implementing it, I would be happy, of course. And yeah, please yeah, approach me if you are, are interested in. I think it's possible. I mean, it also kind of limited squeezing. You can do actually implement that on with just with using a basic CV QKD system. Okay. I guess let's thank Fabian again. <laughs>